Praise the Lord. Amen. Happy Sunday morning. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Praise God. Amen. Turn around, shake somebody's hand, welcome them to the house of the Lord today. It is awesome to be in the presence of God and amongst friends. Amen. Yes, yes. <laughs> Woo. Praise God. Amen. Somebody tell me what the month of October is. The tenth, the tenth month. Does that does that mean it's a tithe month? I don't know. What is what is October? Pastor Appreciation. Pastor Appreciation Day. No, it's not the day, it's the whole month. He gets the whole month. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're, we're excited to be here today, so why don't we just lift our hands and let's worship the Lord together. Thank you, Lord, for this service today. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today. God, we magnify your name. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy today. We magnify your name, oh God. You're worthy, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Sister Audrey's going to come. We have a presentation this morning. We are thankful for our pastor and his family. Amen. Praise God. I've never seen this many people in our church scared that I'm holding a microphone. <laughs> um, so I'm thankful that I was asked to help honor my favorite preacher and three favorite singers. Um, I mean, my pastor and his amazing family. Uh, we have honestly been blessed with the leadership of the Gotro family. In Hebrew, the word for pastor actually means shepherd. The dictionary defines a shepherd as someone who protects, guides, and watches over people. I honestly feel like that is just touching the surface of what brother and sister Gotro do for the people here. They actually invest in people. They care. They bring you into the fold. They restore you. Not only are they shepherds, they're doctors. So, you know, we'll get y'all white coats next year. Um, on a way too personal note, I know uh, it's so shocking that I love this family. Uh, whenever I first came here seven years ago, this is not where I wanted to be. Um, I had been church hurt in the past, and I was scared that it would happen again. But God had given me a dream, and I knew that this is where he was bringing me. And it's easier to go if you're not kicking and screaming, too. Um, so I was, the first time I met Sister Gotro, I don't know if you hate the story, I'm sorry. Um, I met her in Walmart, and I walked away from meeting her, and I said, she's tall, she's beautiful, she's thin, she's smart, and she's nice. We cannot be friends. Um, and so uh, that wasn't true. She is now one of my very best friends, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, and everybody in here, I'm going to tell you what people say behind your back. They call her Wonder Woman because she can literally do anything. Um, so, and then Brother Gotro, one of my first services here, I sat in the back, I was nervous, and I just sat there with my arms folded, and he came up and he's like, you okay? You okay, sis? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, why? And he said, well, you have your arms folded like you're just saying, prove me, prove it, prove it. And I was like, no, I'm cold, I'm cold, that's it. And yeah, uh, he reads people really well, um, so that's not what it was. It was not that I was cold. I was super nervous. Um, what he said was true. I was looking for proof that there was a church that didn't care about an image to maintain or a number to brag about. I was looking for a hospital, and that is exactly what I found here. They have seen me through so many areas of my life. They have been steady. They have prayed with my kids in hospital rooms and in living rooms. They showed me it was okay to cry and then held me whenever I finally did, a couple years. Um, they have been the hands and feet of Jesus in my life. 
I was in church whenever I came here. I talked to God and did everything, mostly, that I was supposed to do. Um, And they met me where I was. And they gently nudged me to go further and get deeper into the word and allow myself to have an intimate relationship with God. I was having a conversation, and the Gotros were brought up. They asked why I trusted them so much since I do not trust easy at all. And I explained that it was because they love unconditionally. I've seen them hug me after I hurt them. There's no motive behind the love that they give. It isn't used against you in the future. It's not used as a bargaining tool. It's just constant. And I was asked to sit and think on those words that I said. And in the silence, God spoke to me and said, that is the kind of love I've been trying to show you. And they do truly love like Jesus. And I know that their two beautiful daughters stand up here and they listen to all the deserving accolades given to their parents, but a lot of times they can be overlooked. You will never meet such genuine, strong, godly, beautiful ladies. They give of their time without being asked. They normally get the pleasure of babysitting all the wild children. I'm talking about mine too, so I can say that. Um, While their parents are counseling, they love deep and pure, and they have just as much of a passion for this church and this work as their parents do. And those girls can pray, and they do, and they pray for the city and this church and the people and us. And we are so blessed to have the Gotro family leading us praying for us and guiding us. I am so thankful for the examples they have given us to be great parents, spouses, leaders, worshipers, prayer warriors, and so many more things. Whenever I pray for them, I pray that God makes our church a church full of Aaron and hers, someone to hold them up whenever they get tired, steady them whenever whenever they need to worship to win the fight, And that we are a people who truly love them and care for them and want to grow the church with them. And I am so thankful they are leaders we can trust and depend on, but that every now and then we get to take some time out and love on them because they deserve that as well. Not off the hook yet. That's a, that's okay. You're fine. All right, brother and sister Gotro, come on, come on up. We just, as a church, we want to say thank you, and uh, brother, thank you for being the shepherd of this flock. We we love you, appreciate you, amen. Sister, thank you so much, sister Gotro, for being you, because there's no other sister Gotro like sister Gotro, and we love these kids. Young ladies, I guess I should say. But uh, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for shepherding. Thank you for being the example. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I would give him the microphone, but we'll wait. Um, We... uh, We have a lot going on today. It's a busy service, but we're thankful for everyone that's here. Uh, Our visitors, welcome today. Make yourself welcome. Worship the Lord with us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for entrusting my church to help you bombard heaven today. Okay. Uh, Brother Warren, good to see you today. And Salmi's good to see you all again today. Welcome. Worship the Lord with us. Brother and Sister Stewart, we're glad that you're here today. Uh, Sister Stewart's going to come in a little while, and she's going to play, and I don't know, you're going to sing? No, that's okay. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But right now, we are going to worship the Lord in song, so let's get our minds and our hearts on the Lord, and let's worship the Lord today, can we? Oh, yeah, don't forget, we do have communion. If you do not have your, your cup and wafer, just wave your hand. And the usher will come by and give one to you. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God.
Justice will shake, every curse will be broken. We're gonna see every word you have spoke. All of the earth will be filled with your glory. Oh, I can't wait for that day when we rise up. Every tear will be wiped from our eyes. We're gonna see you and sing all day. This ought to be the most electrifying, exciting, noisiest, loudest place in Prairieville. And let me tell you why. Because at an altar, whether it be here or spiritual in your room, somewhere in your car, that you repented. When you begin to take and peel back all the past and your wrongs and your iniquities and your trespasses and have them put in a trash can where they'll be remembered no more and they'll be covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. I'm going to tell you, we ought to rejoice today because our sins have been forgiven because we've got a God that looketh after our soul today. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah! Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah! Oh, just let it 
Let it go and erupt in an atmosphere of praise and worship and adoration unto the King today. He inhabits the praises of his people. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Ah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pause for a moment of identification to identify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's mighty and he's powerful. He's, he's famous, he's popular, and yet he knows my name. He's everything to everybody, but he knows where I live. I got to be careful not to preach this morning. We're, we're in a house full of preachers, but there's preach all over in this atmosphere. And I'm just so delighted and grateful for all that God has done for me. And if you've not reached the apex of what God can do for you, let me remind you today. He wasn't just here to do it for me as a minister. He'd done it for me when I was weary, when I was involved in iniquity, when I was overtaken with sin, and he pulled me out of darkness and put me in his marvelous light. He'd done that for me. But he did not do it for me only. He'd done it for everyone that would call on the name of the Lord today. Confess with your mouth today. Oh, what a great God. Woo! Somebody ought to be excited today. Feeling his presence, feeling his power. Amen. I give honor to the wonderful team that serves year round from this church. And thank you for honoring my family. And more than honoring me, it's so important to honor my wife who stands behind me and supports me. You don't know when I'm down. You don't know when I'm troubled. You don't know when I'm sick. You don't know when I'm hurting. She knows it all. These two kids, they have to walk the very straight and narrow sometimes even more. And uh, every now and again, they get a counsel or a phone call because I'm not only their daddy, I'm their shepherd, I'm their pastor. And so it is, Brother Jackson, my, my son-in-law, it's, it's, it's a, as we discussed, it's a very peculiar grounds to tread upon from pastor to father-in-law but we navigate with the help of God we do all things to lift up Jesus I don't always do them well I fall short oftentimes and like you and like Paul I find a place to daily die in repentance to my error and my wrong and my arrogance and my cockiness my ugliness, I know y'all don't see all of that. My wife was so proud. Of, I didn't have road rage one time driving to Tennessee in the mountains. That's proof miracles do still happen. So there's miracles in the house today. Yes, there is. We honor you today for coming with us to be in the house of the Lord. For a moment, you may be seated. Today we set aside time, our formal communion in January, and then, of course, we do several communions throughout the year. Today we will share as a family and as a church in the Lord's Supper. We are not just fulfilling a ritual of the church. We are obeying the words of the Lord, and we are sharing in an intimate moment that the scripture has indicated that you and I would reflect on. And he didn't tell us how many times, but he did say how oft that you do it. The Lord's Supper is a process of, number one, looking back. Looking back to the cross, the sacrifice that was made there by Jesus. And he didn't do it for the whole world, because when he says uh, that we, we have to do this with honor, we must reflect that he done it personally. He went to the cross for you and I. Number two, we must look within. We must examine our lives. We must examine our actions and our motives and our spiritual conditions and seek God 
in repentance. In a moment, we will find ourselves briefly repenting to clean this old body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Number three, looking outward, participating in communion helps us to put into perspective our need for the body of Christ. That body is just not what we will be taking in just a moment, but that body is the whole church. Number four, looking ahead, participating in communion helps us to look ahead to return uh, to the return of Jesus Christ when we will have true communion with our risen Savior. I read to you in your hearing 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Well, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus this same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me pause for a moment that he took something that was whole and he broke it in pieces in a reflection and a remembrance of what was to soon be the past when they would break the body of Jesus Christ. Can I emphasize and just pause for a moment that there is an extreme great need for the oneness of the church. In a moment after we take the Lord's Supper, we will find someone that we are not comfortable finding with. Our guests can participate or be excluded from that. And we will cross aisles and pray for that individual when we're finished with the Lord's Supper. And reflection to remind you that you need that person that you may not visit each and every day. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying this cup is the New Testament in my body. This do ye also oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. This morning as we stand, I want to challenge you for a moment for deep consecrated prayer to search your mind and search your heart and your spirit. Let me share with you that if you repent today that you need to take the Lord's Supper. Some of you feel like it's been a fearful thing for you to, when it comes to taking the Lord's Supper that, that you have to be perfect. You have to be repentant. And, and the condemnation came from the fact that they were not comprehending what was transpired on the cross. They were more just going through a ritual than they were an appreciation of remembrance that Calvary was about you, was about personalizing Jesus giving up his life for you. It was about knowing that when Jesus went to that cross, he went marching to the cross with every one of our sins, with all of my sins and iniquities to that cross. He said to remember, to remember. This morning I'm going to ask that you would take time as I will lead in repentance today. But I ask from your heart that you will use your own verbiage and your own prayer that we would come before the Lord to search our souls. Would you do that? God, we come to you today. Lord, to cleanse our mind and our spirit and our hearts. Any wrong, any flaw, any trespass, any iniquity, Lord, any sin in our heart today, I pray that you would cleanse our minds and our hearts as a body of Christ today. I'm asking Jesus that you would touch each and every individual here getting ready to participate in your supper today, that there would be a powerful move of your spirit, that there would be strength inside of our bodies that would rise, that there would be faith in our mind and our heart today, and that there would be healing within our bodies today. We give you glory in the magnificent and the mighty name of Jesus for what you are doing in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? I want you to open up your supper, the very light layer on the top. We'll give you an opportunity and reveal the wafer today.
when you take this, I want you to remind, remember that that body was being broken and bruised. When you take it, I want you to remember that Jesus was not regretful going to that cross for you, that you mattered, that you were important, and that you were special, and you still are. Lord, we thank you today for the opportunity to participate in your supper. We ask your blessings to be upon this time of remembrance as we break this way for today in remembrance of your body being broke and we take it and ingest it into our body. Would you take that bread? You have just taken the brokenness of the body of Christ to remember all that he has done for you and for me. Then he grabbed the cup of wine representing the blood. What you're fixing to take today is the representation, the typology of the blood of Jesus. It's imperative that if you're going to be saved that you, you have the blood in you and on you. You can find that in the Old Testament. But I offer thanksgiving in this collective body of Christ today. We ask God that you would receive our thanksgiving for this cup. In Jesus' name, you may take. Would you lift up your hands and give him glory and honor today? We thank you, Jesus. We worship you today for what you're doing. We thank you, Lord, that we come to remember you and your greatness. We come to know that you have made us whole and that, Lord, you have come for the unity of the church. We give you glory. We give you honor in this place today. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've done, everything you're doing. We lift up your name today, Jesus. We lift up your name. I'm going to ask you, to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, again, our, our guests, our, our visitors today, you can join in, but do not feel obligated to. We do not want to make you feel out of place today. But I'm going to ask that you find someone that you're not, uh, you do not frequent. And I want you to move out the aisle, men with men, ladies with ladies, and I want you to find someone to pray for. I want you to find someone and ask the Lord's blessings. Would you do that across this sanctuary? the spirit of the Lord is moving in this place the spirit of the Lord is moving in this place right now you're feeling the comfort of the Holy Ghost right now we're loving one another outside of our comfort zone right now we're leaning upon you today Jesus we know that you are working we know that you are moving we know that you are ministering in this place right now we give you glory and honor God we lift up your name in this place today how excellent is the Lord, how great, how mighty, how excellent. We lift you up, Jesus. We lift you up, Jesus. We lift you up. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Make us one, make us united. Make us whole today. Put us together, God. Lifting up one another. Holding one another together. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us strength as we remember what you've done for us at Calvary. Lord, we break, we take that bread that has been broken. We take that wine that represents your blood today. And God, we would excel in your spirit that we would triumph in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am standing here today by your mercy and your grace. With thanksgiving, I will say your word. Your glory fills this place. I will only seek your name with thanksgiving. I will say, You're worthy of my praise. You're worthy
we give you praise today, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord is in this place today. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. As you continue to worship the Lord, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. We're doing things a little backwards today, but it's all right. Amen. All right. Wow, two requests, revival and rain. Amen. We need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And we need a little liquid sunshine. And God is able. Amen. Any other requests that you have that you'd like to make known by the raising of your hand all over the place today? All right. If you need prayer, we serve a God that is able. Amen. You're welcome to come and we'll anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. Let's take these knees before the Lord, can we? God, we thank you, Lord, today, God, for every situation, every name, every life, God, that's represented in this place today. God, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for ministering today. Thank you, God, for preparing our hearts for the word. We thank you, Lord, today for everything that you're doing. We pray for revival, God, and for Ascension Parish and for the world. We pray, God, that you would send rain. God, you know our needs today, and we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for preparing for us, God, and helping us along the way. God, we give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers make their way, praise God. We're going to give you an opportunity to give today. It's good to have all of our visitors worshiping the Lord with us today. Amen. <laughs> praise God. All right, I made, I made a friend today. David, it's good to have you today. Worshiping the Lord. Amen. Praise God. And Lanair, good to have you today, too. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Y'all just make yourself at home. Just worship the Lord. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Let the Lord touch you today. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time of giving. We ask you to bless tithe and our offering today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 And everybody, don't forget about Tuesday night. Amen. We are on module number three. And I'm, huh? 1.4, excuse me. I got to get the technology correct and the lingo right. We are in lesson four. Okay, forget it. Module one, lesson four. See, they'll get me straight. It's what happens. Anyway, forget about what I said. Just come Tuesday night. That's it. We'll let the teachers be the teachers, and I'll just sit there and listen. Amen. God bless you today. You may be seated. We're glad to have the stewards with us today. Amen. Brother Stewart wants you to minister the word of the Lord today. But right now we want his precious wife to come and just worship the Lord in song. Amen. Everybody say God bless Brother Sister Stewart. Amen. 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 You know, the word of God says in the book of Revelations that we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And what else? By the word of our testimony. How powerful is that? We literally, our testimony is literally a weapon that the Lord has given us against the forces of hell. So as I play this song, as we sing this song, I want you to think about those things. Think about those giants that the Lord has already allowed you to defeat. Think about those battles that you have already won through the power of Christ. Think about those things. You know, today we did communion, and communion takes a lot of remembrance. It takes for us to remember that the Lord has been good to us. So I want you to think about those things and make a declaration into the atmosphere that the Lord is good and faithful. Amen.
get together. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he played.
Come on, somebody, if you have a testimony, can you give him praise? If you have a testimony on how you know the Lord has worked on your behalf, has God done anything in your life? Has God delivered you from anything? Has God set you free from anything? When I think about the Lord, somebody, can you just give him glory? Can you honor him? Can you give him praise in our house this morning? We give you glory, oh God, for everything you've done for us and even beyond what you've done. We give you praise because of who you are. Somebody, can you lift your voice one more time? Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we love you. We magnify you. We honor you in this house this morning. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for who you are to us, oh God. You know, if we don't have anything else, we have a testimony. You know, there are some moments that we don't understand what God's doing in the present. And there's sometimes we don't know what God's going to do tomorrow or in the future. But when I look back, the devil may be threatening me right now. The devil may be saying, hey, you should be anxious because of what's going to happen tomorrow. But I can look back and I can say, but devil, I know that God delivered me from it yesterday. And I know that God healed me last time. And so I know God's working right now. And I may not be able to see it, but I know he's going to work tomorrow as well. When I think about the Lord, when I think about what he has done for me, I give him praise. I give him glory. We magnified the Lord on this morning. Thank you so much for being here on this fantastic Sunday morning. To our guests, thank you so much for being here as well. Every service doesn't always have the additions, so I speak on behalf of pastor and just say, Hey, every time you come, it may not be as long, but today is a special day. It's a very unique day. And, you know, God works on in moments like that. Communion Sunday is moments that we say, God, we put our schedule aside. We put to side our expected time to get out of service on today. And we say, God, we're here for a holy moment. We're here for something that's holy means to be set apart. And today is a moment, God, that we have set apart for you, for you to move in our lives. And I believe God wants to do that and will do that in us today. Give honor to your pastor and his wife for not only for Pastor Appreciation Month, but always to Pastor Gotro and Sister Gotro. I joke with pastors sometimes and I say anything for you. And he probably thinks I'm joking, but there's so much significance in that. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Two years ago, he trusted my wife and I to come and minister here for the first time. We had never met each other in person. All we had was a phone call. And he, he must have felt in the spirit, hey, I, I think it's okay for you to come. First time we came, you remember, we didn't, we didn't preach. You guys were praying. The spirit was moving. <laughs> Pastor said, hey, I want you to come back next week. We came back the next week, and... The spirit was moving again. Y'all, you guys were praying. I think we preached for five minutes, and we prayed the rest of the time. And pastor said, hey, we want you guys to come for, I think it was the next three weeks. And so when I say anything for you, pastor, I mean it. Thank you so much for trusting my wife and I. We love you. We love Sister Gotro. We love this church. We give honor to you this morning. Can you give yourself and your pastors a round of applause? I give honor to my wife this morning as well for being here, not only for being here, but for playing the violin. Must be the truth, huh? For singing. I'm so glad to have her as a partner. I'm grateful for all the sacrifices she makes for the kingdom of God, and God never overlooks that. I give honor to her this morning. Yes, can we give her a round of applause? I give honor this morning to everyone that I've been able to speak to. Thank you always so kind, so genuine. Thank you so much for the love of God that we feel here today. Give honor to you. And as we remain standing for the reading of the word, anybody ready for the word of God? Awesome. Give honor to my friend, Brother Boudreaux. I don't know where he, oh, there he goes. Got to have a great conversation this morning as well. Give honor to my brother standing here on the platform. He's helped me so much this morning. He said, hey, you need anything? He said, hey, we're going to do this today. We're doing things a little different. And I just thank him for keeping me in the loop this morning as well.
grateful for all that the, the Lord is doing. We're going to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 3. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 3. When you got it, say, I got it. Isaiah 6 and 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we are going to the book of 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, and I will read in your hearing. It reads as follows, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. Reminds me of what we were just talking about a couple of years ago when you guys were praying and the spirit moved and we weren't able to minister. But that's what we want. That's what we want. It says so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. It says, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. And when you look at these two scriptures, you see the first one I read in Isaiah says, holy, holy, holy. But then it also says, the earth was full of his glory. Then the second, first king, that says that the glory of the Lord filled the house. And when you look in the original language and you research glory, we find that there's a weight to the glory of God. We've heard it said the weight of his glory. There's a significance to the weight of his, to his glory. There's a heaviness, there's substance, there's significance that's attached and comes along with the glory of God. But the angel said, holy, holy, holy. And this morning I want to preach, I want to speak from the topic of the holiness of heaviness. The holiness of heaviness. Why don't you lay your Bibles down and can you lift your voice and can you continue to set the atmosphere in this house this morning? Somebody, can you lift your voice unto God right now? Lord, have your way in this house this morning. Let your will be done. We invite your presence, Lord God, to be in this place this morning. We're not looking for a common experience, Lord God. We're not looking for a typical experience. We're not looking for our normal experience, oh God. Not because of what we've added today. Not because I'm here today. Not because there's something different, but simply because you are here today, oh God. We invite your spirit in that we may have a holy experience and an uncommon experience with you this morning, oh God. Have your way and let your will be done in this house. Give us revelation. Make it relevant to us and help us to understand what your spirit is speaking to us this morning. Have your way and let your will be done and by your grace we'll give you the praise the glory and the honor in Jesus name amen can you say amen, amen. you may be seated in the presence of the Lord you know we've done communion today we've sang about what the Lord has done for us and um you know when I think about things that I'm grateful for. I've had times in my life where they was on a job or in a group setting or at an event, and people would say, let's go around and let's say what we're thankful for. And sometimes, you know, in different seasons, there's different things that you're thankful for. But when people ask me that question, they say, hey, what are you thankful for? There's typically one thing that for the most time, most part of the time, it stays in my mind. And that one thing when people say, hey, what are you thankful for? Whether it's Thanksgiving or an event or just a group setting, there's always this one thing the majority of the time that's in my mind. And the one thing that's in my mind when people say, what are you thankful for? It is relationship with God. Yeah. See, relationship with God has given me guidance when I didn't have any direction. And relationship with God has given me answers from the Spirit when everything in, the, in logic did not make sense. 
Can I say that relationship with God has delivered me from depression? Relationship with God has given me peace and anxiety. Relationship with God has been everything to me. And I am so grateful and so thankful that I have a relationship with God. My question is this morning, who is thankful that you have a relationship with God? Who is thankful that you know the voice of God for yourself? Who is thankful that you know what the Spirit feels like? I am so grateful and thankful for a relationship with God. And I'm not talking about just going to church And I'm not talking about just having a set time of prayer every day. And I'm not talking about only reading my Bible, but I'm talking about walking throughout my day and hearing the voice of God speak to me every moment of the day. Because God is not just at the beginning of my day, and God is not just at the end of my day, but I want God to be the center of everything I do. I am so thankful and so grateful that I have a relationship with the almighty God and see just as much as we appreciate relationship with God and just as much as we're grateful for relationship with God sometimes relationship with God feels like obligation sometimes relationship with God feels like obligation I gotta go to church again I got to get in the prayer room again. I got to go on that fast again. I have to have this conversation and make that phone call again. You know how many times I made that phone call? And sometimes relationship with God feels like obligation. See, the Bible says that God spoke to Jonah. The voice of the Lord came to Jonah. And he said, Jonah, I want you to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. He said, I want you to go. And I want you to preach to the people of Nineveh. The Bible says that Jonah fled from the presence of God. And he ended up on a boat in the middle of the storm. And the people on the boat were trying to figure out, why is this happening to us? Jonah says, look, I'm the reason for this storm. I am the reason this storm is here today. He tells the people, says, hey, I want you to throw me over. And they threw him over. And he got into the water and he was swallowed by a fish. We often say it's a whale, but the Bible just simply calls it a fish. And he was swallowed by a fish. And he was there in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. That fish vomits him out. And the Bible says that the voice of God came to Jonah a second time. The grace of God. When you didn't do it the first time, but God says, I'll speak to you a second time. Voice of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Jonah, I want you to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. This time, Jonah goes. He obeys the voice of the Lord, and he preaches to the people in Nineveh. The people go on a fast, and God has mercy on the people of Nineveh. Bible says Jonah was mad. Jonah was angry because God had mercy on the people he preached to. Jonah was angry that God brought results and had mercy on the souls that God gave him opportunity to preach to. God and Jonah are having a conversation, and Jonah says, God, this is what I I felt the first time. He said, I knew you would have mercy on these people. Jonah obeyed the voice of God, and ultimately he said, How I feel right now is how I felt before I obeyed the voice of the Lord. What am I saying? Jonah's relationship with God, the presence of God, although it changed the people he preached to, it did not change Jonah himself. The way Jonah felt before is the same way Jonah felt after. Why? Jonah didn't go to Nineveh because he wanted to go to Nineveh. Jonah did not go to Nineveh because he had opportunity to go to Nineveh. Jonah went to Nineveh because he had to go to Nineveh. Jonah went to Nineveh because he knew God put me in the belly of a fish because I didn't go. And if I don't go this time, 
God can do something much worse. Jonah did not go to Nineveh because he wanted to go to Nineveh. Jonah went to Nineveh because he had to go to Nineveh. And ultimately, God made him go to Nineveh. Can I tell you why Jonah was not changed by his relationship with God or by the presence of God in that moment? It's because Jonah did not see it as opportunity. Jonah saw it as obligation. Jonah said, I got to go, so I'm going to go. And he was never changed by relationship with God. But can I tell somebody this morning, we are not obligated to be here. I'm not obligated to have a relationship with God. I'm not ob obligated to get into the prayer room. But I have opportunity to hear God speak to me. I have opportunity to feel the presence of God. I have opportunity to know what the voice of God sounds like. I'm not obligated to be here but we have a holy opportunity this morning does anybody know you're not obligated to be here on a Sunday morning you can be at home sitting on your couch drinking your coffee but somebody said God I know I'm not obligated but I know if I walk into that church house this morning I am giving you opportunity to speak to my family to touch my home to minister to my soul God I'm not here because I'm obligated I am here because I want to be here See, when we do it because we have to do it, we're not changed by it. But when we do it because we want to do it, God says, now I have an opportunity to move in your mind, in your spirit, in your family, in your finances, in your home. Does anybody want God to move in the very intimate places of your life? God, you have opportunity this morning. See, when people ask me, they say, why did you move from California back to Louisiana? And again, different seasons, there's different answers, depending on what's going on in life. But there's something that's so common on that, on that list. And I tell them, I say, I love my church. I say, I love my church. Because I remember Sundays being in the altar on my knees with my hand lifted, praying in the Holy Ghost. I remember times being on a Sunday morning and my pastor laid his hand on my head and he said, God's anointing your life. I remember moments going to the church house and being so discouraged on a Wednesday night. But when I interacted with my brothers and interacted with my sisters, I went home with joy and I went home with peace. I remember times I was so broken but when I got into the kingdom of God and began to serve in the ministry I went home restored and I went home refreshed why I wasn't there because I had to be there but I was there because I said God I want to be here and if I give you an opportunity you can and you will work in my life does anybody want God to work in your life? God, I'm not here because I have to be here. I am here because I want to be here. See, the fact of the matter and the truth is, relationship with God is not like any other relationship. I love my wife with all my heart, but my relationship with God is not like the relationship with my wife. I love my friends with all of my heart, but my relationship with God is not like my relationship with my friends. I love my pastor. I love Brother Gotro. I love you, but my relationship with God is not like my relationship with you. If there was a job, my relationship with God would not be like my relationship with my coworkers because relationship with God is holy. See, holy means to be set apart, and relationship with God cannot be like any other relationship you have. I remember when my family moved to California from Louisiana when I was 12. We moved to California, and I remember, as an adult now, I remember a difference between the people in Louisiana and the people in California. See, in Louisiana, we would say, if you get to talking about religion, we'll say, hey, man, you know, what, what, what religion are you? What do you believe? Whatever the question may be. And some would say, I'm apostolic. Some would say, I'm Pentecostal. 
We get to school and some would say I'm Baptist. Some would say I'm Catholic. But they were specific about what they believed. We moved to California and say, hey, man, what religion are you or what do you believe or whatever the question was. And people would say, I'm Christian. They would simply say, I'm Christian. Not I am a Christian. I'm Christian. Christian was just the belief. And there was no I'm apostolic. There was no I'm Pentecostal. There was no I'm Baptist. I'm Catholic. The answer was simply I'm Christian. There was no specifics about it. It was generalized. I'm Christian. And these are some of the same people that you may see smoking marijuana. Some of the same people you may see drinking alcohol. Some of the same people you may see laughing at jokes that were inappropriate. Some of the same people you may see having conversations that were not godly. Can I tell you when I look back on that, I realized that their relationship with God lost its holiness. There was nothing set apart about it. There was nothing unique about it. There was nothing different about it. But it was common. It was mediocre. And it looked like what everybody else had. Can I tell you? I don't want a common experience with God. But I want something that's holy. I want something that's set apart. I want something that's godly. I want something that's righteous. I don't want to have a, a same experience that everybody else has. But we want something that's holy and unique see the fact of the matter and the truth is is that I'm so grateful for a church who appreciates holiness and I'm so grateful for a wife that appreciates holiness and I'm so grateful for an organization that appreciates holiness and knows this was never meant to look like everything else it was never meant to sound like everything else it was never meant to be mediocre or common but God always called us to be holy the scripture says that God, and let me say this, I'm not talking merely about how we dress. I'm not talking merely about how we speak. I'm not talking merely about the things we can do for God. Because holiness was never about what we do for God. It was about who we are in God. I had a friend, he said, God never called us to do holy. He called us to be holy. Peter quoted it and Peter said, be ye holy for I am holy. Which means you can dress holy, you can speak holy, you can act holy and not be holy. But on the contrary, I understand that if I am holy on the inside, I'm going to dress holy. I'm going to speak holy. I'm going to act holy. I will be holy. See, holiness, there's an uncommon thing about holiness. and You don't, tr let me go here. God was speaking to Moses, and he gave Moses the directions for the sons of Levi, for the work of the tabernacle. And God said, look, Moses, everyone's going to have a job, the sons of Levi, for the tabernacle. He said, the sons of Gershon, they're going to carry the hangings, the curtains for the tabernacle. And I'll give them oxen and a wagon to help carry their load." He said, the sons of Merari, they're going to carry the bars and the pillars, and I'll give them wagon and oxen to help carry their load. He said, but the sons of Kohath, they're not going to carry what everybody else is carrying. They're not going to carry the same thing that everybody else is carrying. They are going to carry the holy things, the things associated with the presence of God. Now, while Merari... And Gershon both had wagons and oxen. God said the sons of Kohath, the ones who are carrying the holy things, the ones who are carrying the uncommon things, the ones who are carrying the unique things, the ones who are carrying the different things, the ones who are carrying what I have declared as holy. He said they're not getting oxen and they're not getting wagons. Everybody who carried holy things or normal things common things they got wagons and they got oxen but the ones that carried the holy things God said they have to carry these things on their shoulders why can I tell you that when you carry holy things you were never meant to carry it like everything else 
And when you carry what God has put on your life, which is holy, it was never meant to look like everything else. You were never meant to treat it like everything else. You were never meant to respond to it like everything else. But it's supposed to be unique and set apart. See, the power of holiness is that the God we serve is holy because he's different from every other lowercase g God that anybody would speak of. The Bible we read is a holy Bible because it's a book that's set apart from every book. And God was making a statement to Moses saying, there's some things that they're carrying which is set apart from every other thing. I'm going somewhere. We understand holiness, and we get being set apart, and we understand that our relationship with God is different and, and unique from any other situation or relationship. We get that. But there is something that comes with holiness that we may not always recognize what it is. See, God told Moses, he said, Merai, carrying the common things, the bars and the pillars, they're going to get a wagon. They're going to get oxen to carry their load. He said, Gershon, carrying the hangings and the curtains, they're going to get oxen and wagon to carry their load. He said, but Kohath, the ones that are carrying the holy things, the uncommon things, the unique things, they're going to have to carry that weight on their shoulders. And I imagine that as the sons of Kohath are walking and carrying their load, that they begin to look at the other people. And as that load got heavy, they begin to look at their oxen and they begin to look at their wagon. And they begin to wonder why. When our load is getting heavy, they have wagons and they have oxen. See, they're carrying something common, what everybody else has. But the sons of Kohath, they're carrying something holy, something unique, and something uncommon. And as they looked at the other wagons, or as they looked at the other sons of Levi, or as we look at the other churches, or as we look at the other ministers, or as we look at the other families, or the other career moves, we, look, we see that it's easier for them than it is for us. And there are some things that we have to work so hard for just to get to where they are. They had wagons and oxen to help carry their load. But the sons of Kohath had to carry the holy things, the uncommon things, by the strength of their own shoulders. See, God could have given the sons of Kohath, he could have said, you know what, I'm going to trust in the strength of an oxen that's stronger than a human being. He could have said, I'm going to trust in the strength of a wagon. We can just repair it if it's broken. But he said, I'm going to trust in the weakness of flesh. I'm going to trust in your own mistakes. I'm going to trust in your own insecurities. I'm going to trust in your own brokenness, in your own mistakes. I'm going to trust in the weakness and the brokenness of flesh to carry what is holy unto me. God was saying, I'm not trusting in the strength of an animal. I didn't die to save their soul. I'm not trusting in an inanimate object. But God was saying, I know your flesh may be your weakness, but I still empowered you to carry something that's holy, to carry something that's consecrated, and to carry something that I've set aside for you. But that's not even the point that I feel I want to make. See, Everybody else who carried common things, I imagine the load never got heavy for them because they had wagons and oxen. But the sons of Kohath, what they carried, I imagine as they walked, it got heavy because they were carrying on their shoulders. And it got burdensome because they were carrying this load for years, I would imagine, on their shoulders. We carry things for years, should I say. I would imagine as they walked from place to place that that burden became so heavy because they carried it on the weight of their shoulders. But can I tell somebody this morning what you're dealing with, what you've been carrying, what you've been carrying for God, your heaviness is a sign of its holiness. You see, the ones that carried something that was common, it never got heavy because they weren't carrying it. The oxen and the wagons 
were carrying it. But the ones who carried what was holy, they carried it on the weight of their shoulders. And as they walked, and as it became heavy, I imagine they had to look at what everybody else had and say, you know what, they got it easy. But they had to be reminded by God, but what I got is holy. What I have is holy. And it may not be easy, but I know it's holy. It may not just be a win in the way, but I know that it's holy. And heaviness is a sign of what's holy. See, the truth is we have committed our lives to living holy. But holiness does not come by itself. Holiness should not be taken lightly because holiness is actually heavy. And it's the reason why you feel what you feel when it's time to go to the prayer room. It's the reason why you feel what you feel when it's time to preach again. It's the reason why you feel what you feel when it's time to go on a fast. It's the reason why you feel what you feel when you got to have that conversation with that person, even though you've had that conversation 10 and 12 times because holiness was never meant to be taken lightly. But when God is doing something uncommon, there's much work that goes into it. Can I just minister to somebody this morning and say God did not call you to be common. God did not call you to be typical. God did not call you to look like everyone else. In some moments, God will give us the opportunity to choose what's easy and common or choose what's heavy and holy. And I would prefer to be in the will of God with that which is heavy than to be out of the will of God which that which is easy. Somebody, can you close your eyes right now? Can you listen to the voice of God? Can you just listen to what the Spirit is ministering to you? If you feel to pray, you can pray. But just know this morning that God is saying, I've called you for something that's set apart. I've called you for something that's unique. Don't question why the battle is there. The battle is not there because of your sin. The battle is not there because of your mistakes. The battle is not there simply because I haven't chosen you. But on the contrary, the battle is there because I have called you. The battle is there because I have chosen chosen you. The battle was there because what you're carrying is not common, but I have called it holy. I have called it set apart. I have called it uncommon. I have called it unique. Somebody, can you lift your voice right now? Can you pray in the Holy Ghost if you can? Ramandolo satara. Ramando lo satara, Ramando lo si. You were never meant to carry what they were carrying. You were never meant to carry what they were carrying. There's some things God says is not for you, and there's other things He is destined and designed to be in your hands. Haraba setoro siera, ya Ramando lo si, yo Romanda la maseka. Can you entertain the presence of God? Can you let the Spirit speak to us? Can you let the Spirit move? God, speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, speak to our spirits. Lord God, we know where the weight is that is just giving us evidence that your glory is there. And where the heaviness is, it's giving us evidence, Lord God, that your holiness is there. I believe that this morning God is going to God is going to change our perspectives. And where your spouse has been a burden, God is going to show you he's given you the blessing of companionship. And where your children have been a hassle, God is going to change your perspective and show you that he's blessed you with a, to be a father or a mother of many and where God has allowed you to deal with financial struggle, God's going to show you, you now have opportunity for me to provide supernaturally. And this morning, God is going to literally transform our perspectives from that which is heavy to that which is holy and set apart. And I believe not only will God change our perspective and mentality towards those things, 
but God is going to literally change the substance and the content of those things so that they will not only look lighter than they've been, but they're literally going to be lighter than they've been. And when you walk back into the house or the next time you minister or the next time you have that conversation, it won't feel heavy, but there's literally going to be a load taken off your shoulders. I didn't even plan on talking about this. I remember when I was, my family moved to California. We're talking about Louisiana and California so much today. My family moved to California. And I remember we went there and everything was different. Everything was different. The culture was different. The people was different. The scenery was different. And I remember I would go to school and I would be lonely. I had friends, but I was lonely on the inside. I was down. There was a heaviness that, that came over me, and I struggled. And I know that this wasn't only natural, but it was spiritual. Because California is where I was baptized in Jesus' name. California is where I was filled with the Holy Ghost. California was a foundation for my relationship with God. But before any of that happened, I felt a heaviness. I was lonely, and I was down. And I remember just as a young 12 or 13-year-old boy, my dad came to me. He said, what's wrong? I don't know how he knew. I don't know if he had a conversation with my mom. I don't know if God revealed it to him. He said, what's wrong? He said, come on, let's go talk. And I remember we went, and we went in the room and we talked. And I don't remember anything he said except this. He said, sometimes you need to tell the devil to get off of your back. He said, sometimes you need to tell the devil to get off of your back. And I remember as a 12 or 13-year-old boy, I told the devil, I said, devil, get off of my back. And I tell you, after that day, I never felt that heaviness. I didn't feel that loneliness. I didn't feel that burden anymore because the enemy didn't want me to receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't want me to get baptized. He was trying to put a heaviness on me because he saw the holiness that was coming. See, the, 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 it, Lucifer was in heaven. He was literally in the presence of God. Before he was cast down the earth, we were never in heaven with the presence of God. That means he can recognize the presence of God quicker than we can. And he knew there was something holy coming to the life of Derek. And there was a heaviness that came on me. I believe God will deliver some of us from a heaviness this morning. A heaviness in our spirit. Yes, depression, anxiety, fear, those things, but not just that. A heaviness and a burden that has come with our ministry, that has come with our marriages, that has come because we are carrying something that is holy. And it does not look like everything else. And the enemy would love to discourage you so that you stop carrying and you put aside that which is holy. Oh, I have so much that I can say this morning. But I do want us to have a time to be able to pray. And you close your eyes right now. God, I want you to lead us in this service right now. I want you to lead my words, Lord God. I want you to allow us to be completely in the vein of the Spirit, oh God. Give me the words to say. Give us the ears to hear and allow your Spirit to speak to us in a way that will transform our lives. In the name of Jesus. There's one way I can go, but I want to go this way. I, the thing about the enemy and about carrying something holy is that the enemy wants you to put down that which is holy. He wants you to be weighed down by the heaviness of that thing so much that you literally put down which is holy.
right now where you are. Can you stand to your feet right now? There's so many ways that we can go this morning. Musicians can come if you feel to come. The keyboard if you feel to come. You know, God appeared to, to Moses at the burning bush. And God tells Moses, Moses, I want to call you to deliver the people of Israel out of slavery. Such a heavy calling, but such a holy calling. He says, I want you to deliver the entire body of Israel from slavery into freedom. But before God ever called Moses at that point, Moses had already tried to walk in his calling. The Bible says that he thought God would reveal to Israel that he was delivering them by the strength of his hands. And Moses killed a man, he killed an Egyptian. He murdered him in order to deliver Israel from slavery. And Moses walked for 40 years through the wilderness as a shepherd with the weight, with the memory, and with the heaviness of the mistake he made. He walked in the wilderness for 40 years with the memory of the last time I tried to operate in my calling, I failed. The last time I tried to operate in my ministry, I didn't see what God wanted me to see. The last time that I tried to follow the will of God for my life, it did not work. And God appears to Moses at a burning bush. And God says, Moses, don't take another step. Ultimately, is what he was saying. He said, take your shoes off. He said, this is holy ground. And it's as if God was saying, because, see, God called Moses. He said, I want you to deliver Israel at this point, even though Moses had already tried at the last point. Moses walked in the wilderness with the heaviness of his sin when he tried to answer his calling the first time. And now the second time, God says, Moses, take off your shoes. He says, Moses, this is holy ground. And it's like God was saying, Moses... I want you to take off the heaviness you've carried for 40 years. And I want you to realize that now this is holy ground. And I know you've been taking steps for 40 years of heaviness. But this next step that you're going to take is not like any other step. It's a set apart step. It's not a heavy step, but it is a holy step. And it won't look like every other step you've taken. And maybe you've prayed about it before. Maybe you've fasted about it before. Maybe God's given you a word of prophecy about it before. Maybe you've attempted and tried before. But God is saying this time it will not look like what it's always looked like. This time it will not be common and mundane. But I believe God is about to take us from the spirit of heaviness and walk us right into the spirit of holiness. And we're going to see the supernatural. And we're going to see the miraculous. And you're going to see your situation has been holy all along. Somebody, can you bring your family to the altar right now in this moment? Can you take who's ever next to you and can you grab their hand and can you bring them to the altar? Whether it's a spouse or family or children or a friend. Someone you know, someone you don't, if it's appropriate. There's moments when God stops everything to speak to your family. 
And there's moments when God stops everything to speak to your home. And man of God, God did not call your home to be common. And minister of God, God did not call your ministry to be typical. And woman of God, God did not call your prayer life to look like everyone else's prayer life. But God has called you to be holy. And God has set you apart from everything else. And God wants you to know that he has an uncommon calling on your life. Someone, can you lift your hands right now? And can you lift your voice right now unto God? Ramandolo satara, Ramandolo siera masse, Ya Ramandolo satara basse torobosi, Remanda la masse torobosi, Ya Ramanda rabosse torobosi, Ya Ramandolo satara. Ramandolo. God, we receive an uncommon calling. <laughs> God, we know it's not heavy, but it's holy. God, we know it's supernatural. Halamando Rosatara. Oh, the Lord 
Come on and make this moment personal right now. Make this, this time, this experience personal for God's come. He's, he's here with you right now ministering to you. Would you take advantage of the moment? There's a deepness of God's presence that is lingering in this sanctuary this morning. If you're willing to call upon the Lord, if you're willing to say, God, I need your assistance and your help, if you're willing to get transparent before the Lord, I can assure you today that help Help is on the way. You don't become what you aspire to become without the help of God. You can have all the giftings and the talents and the skills, but you can never become what you desire to become in life, to be whole, to be made well, to be strong. You can only become whole and well by the help of the Holy Ghost. And you know what's in this place today? the very thing that can assist you, that can comfort you, that can lead you and direct you along the way. 
I know we've been in service a while, but there is such a ministering spirit that is in this place. And I wonder, from a, as a family, as an individual, as a young person, as a single parent today, if you'll make a concerted effort and say, God, I've tried it my way, and I've tried to do my best.